Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. Thank you for stopping on by. I'm really excited. I need to just adjust something on my screen real quick. So yeah, I'm really excited that um, you can all join me and we have a couple guests here. I'm gonna introduce them here next. So let's see, I just wanted to quick mention that this has been on my list for quite a long time. I haven't been doing the live streams myself for too long, maybe like a year. And I'm really into chainsaws and arborists and would like to learn a little bit more. So I thought this might be a good opportunity to do that. So let's go to the next slide and I'll introduce you to everyone. Hey guys, thanks for stopping by. So we have Justin and Phil. I just want to test your mics, make sure they're working. Hey everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, what's up? All right. So Justin, how about we start with you? Can you tell us a little bit, just a range or yeah, where you're from, how long, what your business name and everything, how long you've been doing it, things like that. Sure. Yeah, located? so my name is Justin Devastalli. Uh, I've been in the industry about 18 years now, uh, since I was 15. I'm the owner of uh, Spark Tree Solutions, and I operate out of uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. So that is, Clarksville is like the northern part of, t you're like near the border of Kentucky? Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm three minutes away from Kentucky, right outside of uh, Fort Campbell. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have a friend that lives in Portland, and he said sometimes if he goes to Kentucky, like the, the tax is different between one state to the other. So one state, he'll they'll buy their groceries, and I think that's might be Kentucky. The tax is cheaper. Is that does that sound right? I think so. Correct. Okay. All right, and then Phil. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm a I'm Canadian. Canadian. I'm, I'm from, from Montreal, Montreal, Quebec. Quebec. Uh, that's, that's north, north of New York. Of New York. Uh, uh, I've been, been landscaping, landscaping for the past, past 15, 15 years and kind of transitioned into tree care. care. I'm the owner of Vision, Vision Landscapes. landscapes. I got, got uh, seven, seven employees, employees on average. On average. I have a have few a new few trainees, trainees this year. year. And, and we, we, pre we our main, main focus is tree care and preservation. But we know how to take down big trees. Not as much as Justin. Justin's a world-class tree slayer. But uh, we have aspire to be like you one day. So, Phil, you, you do, I'm guessing, a little more range of work. So I see, like, on your – we're going to go to the Instagram profiles. So you do quite a bit of hedge trimming, too? Yeah, that kind of got me into tree work is just me working at heights and realizing that, hey, this is crazy. This is should be qualified as tree work. At the same time, a man and arborist that joined our company and helped develop the tree care aspect. It taught me to become a climber. His name is James. He's still with us today. It's his fifth year. And yeah, so we're focusing on, you know, plant health care. So cabling trees, uh, soil amendments around trees that it could use some help um, as well as uh, pruning. Pruning is, Pruning good, is good repeat, repeat business. business. Uh, removals, I find, we, we don't get don't them get too them often. Too often. Uh, yeah. There's a so st stiffer competition, competition on those prices. prices. So our, our aspect of tree care, care is more for the, more for the future, future, but we, we, still, we still cut, cut them cut down, them down, them down when, when we have, have to. to. So when it comes to like your collection of saws, you probably don't have like one that's like really like a big, huge bar for like the really big trees. So I'm, is that correct? Yeah, we have a we have a thirty one twenty. Justin, what's the biggest saw that you have? Uh, not a not a thirty one twenty. I'm I'm not really. Uh, I don't have any barn saws, unfortunately. Um, but the biggest one I got, I, I say, I've got a couple six sixty ones, and I've got an old uh, Echo eight hundred. I don't think you can find it anymore. Uh, and I I see you the once, and then I got ran over uh, by a, by a skid steer. So, oh, man. I still have it. A box of pieces. <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah, so I think the 800 now is only available in South America. From what I understand, it's okay. like an 80 cc saw. I'm mm -hmm. guessing. That, so I, it's been a while that I looked up the specs on it. So uh, I did want to say, hopefully that all the or the live streams working okay. Normally I plug in my hotspot or my um, Ethernet cable, but we're just going off Wi-Fi. But it seems like things are going pretty good. Hopefully so. Let's just take a quick minute to jump in the chat. Uh, Jeremy is here. Let's see. All right, Jeremy. So thank you for stopping by. You have a couple questions already. So I'm doing well. So you said your neighbors bought a stump. Let's see. Oh, wait, hang on. Sorry. So yeah, you said your neighbors bought a stump grinder for the golf course. So it sounds like you live on a golf course. Sorry, I 
changed my format a little bit where I have my comment section. So I was having a problem with some of my comments getting buried. So if you can just bear with me a second. Um, I just want to grab my comments and pull them over here so I can respond a little bit better. I should do it while you guys are talking. <laughs> um, so Jeremy's asking me, so I'm not a tree professional, but I'm definitely a tree or definitely a chainsaw person. I partially heat my house with firewood. So I have, I often will go through like five full cords of firewood and I have yeah several different chainsaws. I grew up in a house where we also heated part of our house with a fire, actually a fireplace isn't really great for heating it, but it, the fireplace is located on the lower level of this tri-level house we had. So it was always really cold down there and we just ran that fireplace all the time. And so my dad and I, he had a one chainsaw and like two axes, that was it. So now I think I'm constantly like overcompensating for like the lack of equipment we had that we got by with. So now I started like collecting axes and I've had some people send me some. So I kind of have more than I need. I have quite a collection. So Jeremy was asking me, let me pull it up. So what chainsaws do you use all the time? Uh, let's see. It's, let me hang on real quick. Let me just grab it. It's right around the corner. Right, here. Go get it. <laughs> Can't have too many chainsaws. Honestly, uh, yeah. I, we're the mentality to have way too many. If we have one that is going to die down uh, or have like a broken part, uh, we still need to get work done. So we have we pretty much have doubles of every saw. We have like two 592s, two 572s. Uh, we're getting a new 562. I already have one, two 550s. It's all a Husqvarna range. Is that the 7310? Yes. Yep. I got that so, one too. Yep. So when it first came out, they didn't have the full wrap on it. So um, I ended up putting one. Well, there's, it's kind of a long story, but I ended up with one with a power wrap on it. So when you get something this heavy, I have the 32 inch bar for it. And it's just really nice having that on the bigger saws. And then, um, yeah, I have echoes. For some reason, the model number is escaping me. Justin, it's the one that you just put the muffler on, the Echo Arbor uh, saw. Yeah, the 25 Yeah, yep, yep. So I have that version with, it's the TN version, so it has that, is it called a nano sprocket? So it's a thinner chain and faster. It yeah, doesn't have the port of pitch. pitch. Yep, yep. So I do have to say, um, I took your advice. I did order that muffler, so it came in. Um, that's something that you, you guys will probably see on my channel. Did you have to adjust your carburetor putting that on? I did. I, I watched some videos on that. I've seen a bunch of stuff about you know taking the, the limiter caps out and all that. And then actually, I talked to a local guy that was going to get it tuned up. I'm just been rocking the sense, man. It's it's it's. it's so I have to go down to my local dealer here tomorrow. I'll probably drop it off and see what he says. Yeah, I was seeing something like the 70. Actually, I'm going to plug my Ethernet in just to hang on a second. Hopefully it doesn't affect anything. I'm getting just a little bit of lagging. Oh, shoot. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of lagging, so I'm just going to plug this in real quick. I don't think it'll affect anything. So it's one of those last things to do before going live. Yeah, I just got an error message on my... All right. So the Ethernet... Yeah, it said your YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. So that should be fixed in case anybody has that issue going on. All right. Uh, so far on the chat or on the poll, we have 100% gas. Um, Want to just catch up on some of the... Chats here. So BW's Electric. Hey, welcome to the channel. I have both gas and battery chainsaws. So yeah, I'm really impressed with the battery. I was going to, I have to get to the Instagram, but I'm kind of diverting a little bit. So when battery first came out, the company Sunjo and Snowjo, they're both out of New Jersey. It's the same company, but they have like a winter and a summer version. So they sent me one of the first battery chainsaws I've ever seen. It's a, just kind of a smaller homeowner model and it had a really slow start when you pull the trigger and really soft start, I guess you'd say. And then it just never really seemed to 
like continuously power through the branch. So like, you know, you have like limbs huh. like that that you're cutting and it just struggled. So at first I wasn't that convinced with battery, but just the way the batteries are advancing, there's just that instant power, like within one second, you're up to full speed. So I definitely like having a mix between the two. So, and I'll wonder what you guys, what your take on it. Just, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was, uh, yeah, being honest, I was super skeptical. I, I didn't use battery power. I didn't really have too much interest in it until kind of recently started going in, you know, some free expos and seeing, you know, you know, pros on, on social media and things like that use them. Uh, and that's the highlight of them. So, so the very first battery power change all I had was uh, the Echo, you know, 2500, top title. And uh, I was beyond impressed that's because I guess I guess my biggest thing would be not having to, you know, put a start every single time. So, I'm, I'm, so I know I mean, I've been just a few days, how like, you know, shoulder pain, elbow, wrist, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've. And, and there's some other brands who I've tried out, and I've seen the exact expos that are just, you know, phenomenal. Uh, the Husqvarna, I'm sure, uh, Phil, you're, you, you know, uh, a guy that works for me uses the, I can't remember the model, but the, the climbing saw. And it's, this is the strongest one I've ever, I've ever seen. It's, it's impressive. Yeah, the Husqvarna, the top handle, of, we've had the 540 for a few years. Um, Husk, Husqvarna is sending me their new 542. I'm pretty stoked about so it has a clutch in it and apparently you can't bog that thing down um i had the dcs 2500 tn from echo in a tree today doing a cedar removal great saw for the majority of it but like it's the 10 inch bar you can't bury the bar fully without it like bogging down right i'm not quite uh there's a 2.5 uh, amp hour battery and i'd like to see eventually maybe like a bigger battery in that casing someone actually made a comment on my post about that today so that's something you'd like to see in the future but it's nice to see these different companies uh, pushing the the bar no pun intended if, with, with, the, with these little chainsaws that echo is so light if you have to go up and get some deadwood you don't want to carry up a, to a 201 unless you have to um you know i uh, it's just such a pleasant little saw to take on you if you need to go into a tight little canopy. Uh, it, it's an absolute joy to work for. Uh, with, uh, I believe in having enough saw for every occasion. If we're gonna do a removal, I mean, as soon as like that echo, like I, I couldn't go anywhere. I needed a bigger saw. I got the 201, finished the tree right away. So you, it's good to have different saws for the uh, for different occasions. But repeat starting, repeat starting a gas saw um, does something to your shoulder. I mean. I think Justin, you have a lot more experience than me when it comes to starting a, a gas saw in a tree repeatedly. Uh, you're a strong dude, but I'm sure you feel it after after the week. Yeah, for sure. I know Echo did something with one of their saws. I think it. Uh, I'm trying. It's not not the compression button, but it's um, something else. A, a way that they can have like 25 percent less, like a, a couple of their saws. Uh, it's been probably like three or four years ago that I've actually read up on it. So it's something that's not right top of my tongue to be able to speak on, but it's something that they did that, to help minimize with the starting. I'm not sure if it, they added some, yeah, I better not even try, try to explain it, but I just know it's somewhere like around 25% less pulling. So, um, hmm. all right. Oh yeah. I just want to catch up on the live stream a little bit. And then I do want to get to your Instagram. <laughs> It's easy for me to get sidetracked. So, all right. All right. So, yeah, BW's Electric. Hey, thanks for – all right, I got that. So, Scott Landscapes from Acme, what's up? How's it all going? Going good? Scott, good to hear from you. Uh, the Black Sheep Lawn Care, how you doing? Would it um, would it be a good to do all chainsaws? I'm guessing in battery – So <laughs> I'm guessing that's a question. So I'm thinking some, yeah, it's hard to say it, you guys can speak on it, <clears throat> being able to do all battery chainsaws. I, can, I just don't think the power is going to be there <clears throat> when you get out of like the midsize saws. What do you guys think? I mean, like the, uh, I think still has, still has a new like 300. I don't know exactly what it's called. Um, 
like even like the Husqvarna, like this new saw that they have coming out, it's a rear handle. You can take a 16 inch bar, it's going to be called the 542 IXP, so it's not a top handle. That thing with a clutch in it is going to act like a gas saw and it's going to be battery. So uh, for those who, for example, you don't know what it, the, you saw a tree fell at your house. Um, if before like trying to cut this apart, I would 100% recommend get, you know, get, get some chaps on. I mean, chainsaw boots are five, 600 bucks Canadian. That's pretty expensive. I mean, I would say like, if you can afford those, that's good. But just for starters, get some protection on your legs, get some chainsaw pants, get some chaps. And then if you're not super confident for gas saw, get a battery saw. Um, that will definitely uh, be a safer approach for you going out to work. A battery saw, you know, it's going to start all the time. Uh, and don't be overly concerned about runtime. Uh, what I tell people is get two batteries because by the time one charges, you're not going to have drain the other one. Uh, they're very, very, very efficient, and you'll be surprised with their power. So, I mean, that's a good one. I know Ego has a, a brand new a CX5007. I actually have it. It's in my shop. It's a 60cc equivalent rear handle battery. So, it, it's mm. mind boggling. And all these companies are coming up, but it's a heavy tank. But if you're talking about an all purpose saw, you're probably looking at a rear handle. You don't need an arborist top handle. If you're just learning and you're doing things on the ground, get a rear handle battery saw. Or like if it's a gas, Justin, do you have like the 261? I have a 550. I think that's about equivalent. Like what's, what, what would be like a 50 cc steel saw you'd recommend? I would say maybe 50 cc. What would be the 461, 462? I'm not. I'm not yeah, too sure. I, I jump up super quick because I mean the five hundred eye is literally like I use that for everything. And then I've got you know a couple of smaller saws with twenty inch bar, like six twenty, you know the echo, but uh, it jumps super quick too. And then you know the five hundred eye, and then the you know my my big ones. All right, I want to jump real quick. I have a little bit, so I apologize. Catching up to do in the comment section, but I want to just check this off my list a minute. So you guys, everybody watching can see a little bit more what you guys do. So I have a couple of video clips from Instagram. So I first wanted, I was going to do this earlier on. So I haven't been really great at like following the flow of how this was going to go. But first want to say a big thank you to Echo Means Business. So that's a group that the three of us are in. And it's a, we're a volunteer group and we are brand neutral and we're just different industry pros people that are in the green industry lawn care landscape trees arborists and we just offer <clears throat> advice to other people and it's a chance for us to test some equipment and share different things or practices so if you go to echomeansbusiness.com you can learn a lot more and actually i'm going to go to the next slide where we'll check out the echo means business instagram page so Thought this would be a good opportunity to show a little bit. So I have, all right, we're gonna, oh yeah. So right here, over here, I have a clip. So this is, Phil, this is something that you have on the Equimines Business Instagram page. And I can really relate to this because I grew up on some land that had a lot of weeping willow trees. And as a kid, I was climbing them all the time. So I was pretty daring going way up there and you know, you can just start to feel it. This, way up top, but a weeping willow is, we had a lot of apple trees too, but the weeping willow was, we had a couple that were really fun to climb. Hey guys, my name is Phil. You can follow me on Instagram at phil.vision. Ever since I was young, I was climbing trees. The only difference right now is that I'm getting paid for it. At seven years old, I would climb these monster silver maples in my backyard, driving my mom absolutely bananas. And right now I run a tree care company and I do this for a living. I consider myself extremely lucky and have great, great, great times swinging around canopies. Hey guys, my name is Phil. You can follow me on Instagram. Right. And then there's one other one. This one, I recently, yeah, I'll play this other video. So this is talking about some of your gear and Justin, oh, hang on a second. I have, I think I had the wrong camera. I wasn't looking, so this will, all right, <laughs> that's better. Yeah, just, okay, making sure I have everybody all correct in there, not showing me twice. So this one, yeah, so you're talking about gear, boots, and helmets, so I'm, I'm not sure, like, in Canada, there's different brands that are available there that might be different, like here in the States, so I'll ask Justin, what you think after 
watching this clip. You are responsible for your own safety, so let's make an educated decision on what to wear that will be comfortable for the right season and keep you in this industry for a very long time. Your boots have to have the I love to wear these factor. The Zero is a very, very light pant. It's under 2.2 pounds. They have fantastic vents, fantastic pocket. Favorite pants from Collager, it's called the Ascent. The helmet is gonna be your most expensive piece of PPE. Protoss is the standard when it comes to helmets. Has the best side impact rating, high quality intercom systems to be able to talk with other members of your crew. You are responsible for your own safety, so let's right. make an educated decision on what to wear. All right. I think Justin has all of that stuff, don't you? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, man, super, super important. I actually just got, uh, so I've been wearing the clogger, you know, chainsaw pants, uh, man, for, for a while now. I've got a couple other pairs, but I just got turned on to uh, our wear chainsaw pants, and they had the sale. They were like 150 bucks, and they are like, they feel like the, the clog spider climb pants, but they're chainsaw pants. I mean, they're Oh, you know, wow. Half the way with the clogger, it feels like a summer chainsaw pant. And honestly, I, I I wouldn't want to try it, but it, it you wouldn't even, and it sounds like a salesman, but you wouldn't even believe they're chainsaw pants. Um, so, but yeah, great stuff. The Protos helmet, huge believer in that, and it's super comfortable, but yeah, safety, safety for sure. Yeah, the first thing yeah. that resonate, I was just going to say, the first thing that resonated with me with that clip, when you're talking about your footwear, just having that, I love it factor, and I spend a little more money just on a pair of, work boots not like for chainsaw purposes but when i put them on they just have that feeling like i feel like i'm ready to go to work in them you know they just i, I think they're a little bit taller so i just kind of feel a little bigger and stronger <laughs> wearing them which is kind of a weird thing to say but i definitely yeah like them yeah we have a bunch of new employees this year and everybody gets a brand new pair of hakes boots it's it's it's, it's, it's money but I want my guys to be, you know, uh, safe, obviously. And 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 we tried using a used pair on on a new guy, is slightly used, and they were broken in differently by somebody else, and he wasn't comfortable. And I'm like, that's not a problem. We'll, we'll get you the same size, but brand new. And uh, he loves them. And those boots, I was watching one of your other videos. So, like, if you're standing on a ladder or a limb, you don't. They're like supported, so you don't feel like that pressure, just like on one part of your foot. Is that? Does that sound correct? How yeah, you describe it? Usually I have them under the desk, but they're not here today. But yeah, they're exactly so. The soles are not as flexible. I have different kinds of boots for different occasions. We were talking about the chainsaws. Uh, I have a boot that I'll use if I'm like today I did a removal and I had my spurs on. I'll use my Hakes and then I'll use my Andrews boots, which are a bit more nimble for climbing in crotches if I'm doing a prune. Um, Andrew, uh, Justin, do you have one pair of boots that you rock all the time or do you have a couple on rotation? No, nah, I just have one pair. I, I used to climb in uh, in logger boots with a steel shank, and then uh, I just I don't know. That's just like what I started out, you know, wearing is all you know spur climbing stuff, and then I got the Arb Bros, which is super comfortable. I love it. Not the greatest boot on the ground if you're you know dragging the brush or you know doing that kind of stuff, but uh, I, I love them on spurs or you know send this clip it and send it to it. That's that's my favorite, boot, my go-to for now. Um, all right, I'm going to play one other clip, and I was, let's see, yeah, I was telling Justin, a lot of his clips have music to them, so I'll get demonetized, so I found one of his clips here that, um, I'll just say, if you scroll through, you'll just see there's quite a few, like, where he's up pretty high, and this one right here, um, I'm going to ask you about it after I play it. Oops. Nick. Just a little while, just to see. So, what were you saying at the end there, Justin? It was just a little wobbly. <laughs> no, it was. Uh, I was on. I was on the comms on the helmet, and uh, just uh, the ground guy. He made a joke, so you know. I'm sure Phil knows. If, if you have all your guys on comms all day, you know you practice different different types of you know tree jokes and 
and humor and stuff like that. So I don't, I'm gonna keep. I'll keep the one, but you know, it's just guys at work just having fun and, and joking around. So I, he made me laugh. But I can't remember exactly my my responses. So when you're cutting something like that, does the tree then start to sway quite a bit when you lose that extra weight on top? Not, not like that. If if I was to rig that top out, um, unless the ground is is really clear, you know, usually majority of the time I have somebody that can really let it run. But if I was going to rig that top out with a negative rig, uh, they don't let it run properly. And again, I mean, I've been for quite a few rides in, you know, the, the longevity of my tree climbing career. Um, so when you when you are rigging stuff like that, like sending it, I mean, I, I don't think I felt it at all. But if you're rigging it and you add these, you know, different forces applied and if someone, you know, don't, doesn't let it run. It just comes over and shock loads the tree. Then you'll, I'm sure you can find videos all day long of people getting shook around and their spurs kicking out. How high would you, would you say that was? Mm, it really wasn't that high. I would say probably 40 or 50 feet, maybe it was a small okay. maple. Um, and then right behind that, we did an oak removal and, and that was probably 85. Oh wow! The goat maybe it, it kind of makes it look a little, a little higher than than a, than a man. Yeah, it's going by like the amount of time when you cut it. It just kind of seemed like it had a lot of air time, but maybe some of that catches some wind too. So it's kind of like a little yeah. bit of a sail. Um, just I just going through the comments, they're wondering if you could lower your volume potentially on your computer. That might help. We're getting a little bit of echoing. I'm not sure if if that just if you can still hear us. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, oh, maybe it's me. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to try to lower my volume on here too. I think the best thing, here's something I could do. I have some headphones. So we'll see if this helps. So I know some people will use their headphones. Then I can have it as loud as I want. So I don't know if you're, if you guys are still there, if you can, Tell me if that's making a difference. Justin, can you say hello? Yep. <laughs> Let's see if it's... Yeah, I'll do it now. I'm trying to mess with the uh, microphone now. I'm hearing it cut out a little bit when I have my headphones. So I'm not sure if it's your volume. I'm not sure if I can do something here. Um, but anyways, if we can't fix it, we'll just have to keep moving on. Uh, so Jeremy is asking, what pull saws do you use? Do you guys, I have a couple different ones. I do a lot of testing. So um, I have one of the Echo, they call them power pruners, I believe. They're not, they're not, they don't call them like pull saws, but uh, I have that and I have a Milwaukee one that's battery powered. And it's just amazing, like how well they help me work. I don't know if you guys have, if you run any pull saws, Phil. I'll start with you. Yeah, so we have uh, a bunch of uh, Husqvarna ones. So they are the, uh, I think the, I think they end in IP, IPT4. Anyways, it's like a long telescopic one, and we have shorter ones as well that are like fixed. Um, those ones are great for doing small little cuts out of a bucket where you don't want to necessarily have to haul around a 15 pound tool. The shorter pole saws are five, 10 pounds, five pounds lighter, and they're great for hedge reductions because they're a foot shorter as well. You go up a ladder and you're topping a hedge. Uh, if you have a long pole saw, you, you have to have your ladder further away from the hedge just to be able to make that first cut because you're coming up the ladder of a huge tool. So having like a little short of a pole saw, which is a little lighter, is very convenient and, and all, a, lot, a lot better on your shoulders whenever you're trimming nonstop for, for a very long time. I used a, well, actually I was helping somebody else. He rented a lift like a 45 foot lift. And then he had a pull saw. He has a, I'm not sure what the model is, a steel one that worked really well for him. We had this huge Norway maple that mm. I don't know what you call a tree that grows like in a couple clusters. There's a term for that type of tree. So the, it was like at the crotch right about four feet off the ground. That's where the wind blew it and it split. Just starting to ride out in there. We knew that tree was going to go out someday with this huge storm is what blew it out and then it was laying laying over the road so we cleaned that up then the next day he we it was pretty close to a building so we ended up doing it ourselves but he rented a lift with a pole saw and we were so for someone that's not a professional that worked really well for us 
So I don't know. Do you guys ever use those on lifts? Yeah. Justin, I'll start with you. Or we talk on yeah, pull saws. I, I, uh, I just bought a, a pull printer attachment for my uh, PDAS, my little battery powered the Echo. And I've only used it once in the last maybe four months. Um, just because I, I don't really get the opportunity to. Uh, I mainly do removals. I do some trimming and stuff too, but not. And I don't have a lift. Uh, very, very rarely will I will I work out of a lift. It's usually for another company. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I've used pole saws in the past, tons, tons of times. But I, I, I rarely get the opportunity anymore. Yes, yeah, if you're not using it that much, it probably makes sense to go battery powered. It has the power to run that shorter bar, and then you don't have to worry about the fuel storage in it and you know, having the carburetor issues with it sitting for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Jeremy, I'm going to catch up on some of your questions. So he's sorry if I, Oh yeah. BW's electric said auto compression drop on start is nice. Um, Jeremy asks, what do you do with tree stumps when you cut them down? That's a good question. Cause I have some experience with that too as a builder, taking trees out and hiring tree people. So I'd like to hear, Phil, if you don't mind going first. Well, uh, if you have a wide open field and you want, and you're on a budget, you can leave like a four or five foot stump and come in with an excavator and get to rock the stump out with a high peg. So there's like leverage that you can do with that instead of just trying to dig it out. For example, if you have a five ton excavator and it's a big stump and you don't think the excavator can take it, if you rock it a bit, you might be able to break some of those surface roots and, and, and take it out somehow. Uh, we typically, uh, we have a stump grinder. We have a SG40 from Bandit, um, small little tracked unit. So we work in a dense residential area. So all the pieces of equipment that we own, our loaders and everything have to be able to fit into yards. Our 87 foot spiral lift fits through 37 inch gates. It's 36 inches wide. And we took it through a 37 once and it was like not much room <laughs> on either side. We barely got it in. Um, so what we'll do with stumps is if the clients want it done, we will uh, charge them accordingly. We always like to pick, clean up the stall mulch. That's what the hardest part of stump grinding I'd say is dealing with the mulch. Uh, you get cheap pricing all the time for mulch. If you're grinding, they leave a huge pile. Uh, a residue and that stuff is real heavy. So we we don't leave the residue behind unless like the clients, like they want a super cheap price and it's like uh, in the far corner of a property, whatever. But it's really not something that you want to let the client have to deal with. So we just include it in our price. We sell it as a more premium service. It might cost the customer a bit more dealing with us, but in the end, they're not going to sweat having to shovel up all this mulch. And one thing we always do is we always put, a, whenever we're digging into the ground, we always put in, uh, we call info excavation as a free service and we um, put in the address and they're going to send us any locations of underground gas, electrical. That's like a, an absolute must for us in our area. Uh, there are so many underground uh, uh, conduits uh, on these properties. The average property we work on is like six or 7,000 square feet, right? In, in, in city areas. So you can just imagine what you find underground. So that's how we approach stump grinding. Uh, we have like a trailer that has our stump grinder and our loader at the same time so we can like easily process the mulch just get rid of it all in one shot and leave the clients with uh with a clean job immediately how about you justin nice yeah i uh for any stump grinding i, I have a couple friends of mine locally uh that i just sub those out to uh, just so i don't have to deal with it it's it's been something in the past that i that i did with, with other tree companies way back and uh i had you know, maybe some some day way down the road when I'm not, you know, climbing and doing stuff like that. But um, it's it's not very. Uh, it doesn't really tickle my psych level, you know. Like yeah. running the grinder, I I get kind of antsy. But uh, so I, I sub those out to people, and and I've got a really good relationship with some local stump grinders and kind of collaborating in that that realm of uh, you know tree care. So when it comes to stumps, I just quote out you know the stump removal or the you know tree removal. And then, you know, give them the expectation of what they're going to be left with. And if they do want stump grinding, that's, you know, they completely deal with the referral process, of, you know, the two or three grinders that I use. Gotcha. Yeah. I, a lot of my experience is being a home builder. I'm not doing it currently, but I can think of one particular city lot that we had and we demolished this house and we put a new one in place of it, but there's this huge 
um, walnut tree in the front that we had to take out. So I remember, so I had an excavator, his name is Mark, that I work with. So I feel like you mentioned, he said, like, leave it high so that way they have some room to dig out the roots around it. And so I remember <laughs> the tree guy, I forget his name, that we hired, he got to put a big chain around it. We just lifted this thing. It's just massive and put it in the back of a this his old dump truck and it looked like you know it was like squatting down the dump truck i don't he probably yeah. found some field to dispose of it but um yeah i don't know i guess you could probably stump grind about anything down can't you like any tree if you have a big enough stump grinder yeah pretty much yeah yeah they got some massive ones that are towed behind kind of like a trailer and like they have 22 inch wheels and they can like destroy stuff 24 inches deep it's crazy oh, uh huh. but ours uh, i think has an 18 inch wheel um but you gotta look out for rocks you gotta look out for a ton of stuff uh, the they're high maintenance we actually don't make a lot of money on it but we'd like to offer it to our clients so they don't have to look somewhere else we don't have to wait two weeks for a subcontractor people have a very short attention span i feel like in our area, we had to be able to offer quick in-house service. And we were using a great subcontractor, but he moved away. And uh, we <sighs> were kind of forced to buy one ourselves, but uh, that that's life. What brand did you say you have? It's a Bandit. And oh, yeah, we had a yeah. question about our chippers as well. Um, I have two Bandits. Justin and I have a very similar chipper. I have a um, 12 XPC and a 15 XPC. Uh, which are 12 and 15 inch chippers. Mine is a wind. I think Justin, you have the 15 XP, correct? I think, right? So that's on a yep. heavier duty yeah. frame. And you have the winch? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bandit makes, uh, they make great chippers. I mean, you have Vermeer, you have Bandit, you have more bark. You have like three, in my opinion, big, big king companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be honest with you, you know why you went with Bandit? It's because they stock, they have stuff green in stock. And we love green. A lot of our equipment is green. And <laughs> it's a stock color and we're like, what can we do? Let's, let's do it. So I have a question. Um, so I, I rent from our local place and they have a bandit one and one, the bigger one is the diesel and that one's not always available. So then I'll get the smaller ones. So I do some cleanups once in a while. So the smaller one is gas. So I was wondering, do you guys have a gas or diesel one? Your chipper. That's a great question. My, mine's a, uh, gas. They wanted uh, an extravagant amount of money for the diesel, and uh, this one was ready sooner. So I took I took the gas, and uh, that's just kind of how, how it worked out for me. What, what's your feel? Yeah, I have, I have gas engines as well. I think yeah. one's a eighty nine in the twelve, and I think I have one hundred forty five gas in the other one, uh, in the fifteen. All my trucks are gas because we do such a we have such a small work radius. Um, the only diesel equipment that we have is we have Kubota engines in our loader, in our uh, lift. Actually, we got a question about a lift. Uh, we have a spider lift. It's in Italian. It's called Easy Lift. Um, it's called something else in Italy. Uh, it's from a company called Up Equip, UP Equip, E Q U I P. Actually, they're in our province of Quebec, which is crazy. They go over all these trade shows in the States. And then we chose this company because they had a reputable unit. Um, we can service it right here in province which was huge for us we, we i can drive it an hour away some people that have broken lifts they're like sending them on transports back across the border to them which is mind-boggling to me so whenever we find somebody nearby that can deal with it for us service is huge we like to offer great service we expect it in return of our pieces of equipment but yeah um diesel engine kubota uh small but yeah i'm like justin uh, i was not gonna dish out a ton of money for a crazy diesel engine i mean uh, those are good i think for like street side companies that are doing these big forestry management projects and they need to have that chipper running at full capacity all day long but that's not us uh you know we're smaller business owners and um i think cost of ownership with the gas is probably gonna be cheaper uh, long term and then you i'm guessing like with the diesel one i run it just seems like it goes through everything but the gas one as long as you know like not to overload it, you're not going to stall it out. So maybe there's like a learning curve. That's what I've experienced when I went to the smaller one. It was once in a while like jamming up, and then I had to like shut it down and clear it out. So do you guys? Yeah. How small have, did you rent? Uh, boy, it's been a while. I forget what what the size was offhand. The last one was gas. Mm -hmm. The one before that, I just remember being their bigger diesel. So I don't know if they would a ten inch 
be like the bigger one? You know, the handle a 10 inch tree. Does that sound yeah. like a pretty big one? Yeah, I'd say that's a, that's a, a, a low middle range chipper. Uh, okay. Maybe yeah, like six, nine, 10, 12. Um, I really think life starts at 12, to be honest with you. We, I bought a six inch chipper and it was the biggest mistake I did. I did 0 0.9 hours on it and I returned it to the dealer. I took a $4,000 hit. I bought Ooh. the 12 inch. I made that money back though in a month of productivity because a six inch chipper, you're watching every branch go in. It can't suck in big unions. So you got to like make relief cuts on every single piece and you're watching the branches go in one at a time, one at a time. Whereas the 12, four people can, you know, line up, throw a branch in, go get another one and that thing will just keep on. And that's not even the 15. The 15 is ridiculous. Hmm. So if you're, you're looking to buy a chipper and you run a tree care company, I would stop thinking about this year. Think immediately for next year. Take, bite, bite the bullet. Get a 12-inch chipper at a minimum, and the amount of efficiency you'll it'll increase. It'll make up that payment if you're making payments. Um, that's a whole another thing we can talk about. Is like Justin, did you pay cash for your chipper? You're making payments. If you don't mind me asking. No payments. Yeah. Yeah. And payments are are fine. Like no, none of us have a hundred thousand dollars lying around for a wood chipper. Uh, but you know, you start making payments on it and the efficiency that you can, you can, and the extra money you can bring in with this equipment is going to make up for that payment. And in my experience also fund your next piece of equipment. So that's how we've been able to scale and grow so much in five years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, as you're talking, I probably have a, I, the last one I ran was probably a 10 and that was a smaller one. So the diesel I'm sure was bigger than that. That just, it's been a while that I've rented it and trying to, as you're saying it, um, that sounded the way you're describing it. That's I had to be really careful and make those relief cuts. So that's one of the first things I like about a gas chainsaw or the, that scenario when you're loading the chipper, you have like your earmuffs on and you're trying to start your gas saw. It will probably start in the first or second pull, but the battery, you don't have to like wait to feel the vibration of it. You can just, you know, release the, the brake and just go with it. That's, so I like to keep one of those nearby when I'm just for me personally, like when I'm using it, I don't always know like how much I can feed it. And so to prevent it from jamming or, you know, how to prepare the, all that before it goes into the chipper. So that's something that I learned. Uh, let's see. I was going to just see if there's any other questions. So we've got a few minutes left. I do have a couple things, a list I just wanted to look at to see. Um, I have a big, cottonwood tree that I'm going to be taking down in my yard. It's been dead for a couple of years. Do you have any advice with cottonwood? Any love, hate I with do. them? Or, okay. <laughs> Call Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I couldn't even tell you the last time I climbed a cottonwood. Back in Ohio, that's for sure. I mean, it's been probably seven or eight years. I don't see them out here. Hmm. But I'll come climbing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's in a big enough area, I have a big rope I was going to put on it and then hook it to one of my vehicles and then have my son pull it while I'm cutting it. So you guys probably don't like the sound of that. It doesn't sound very professional, but kind of it's the country a, that's. I, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. What I would recommend is two things. Be very careful, like measure the tree, see where exactly it's going to fall. Um, make sure you put your rope at least two thirds up the tree. The biggest mm. thing I hear like clients all the time saying, look, oh, I'm going to tie a rope there and pull it over. And they're talking like eight feet off the ground. It's not enough. You got to use a lot of the physics here to your advantage. Um, shoot our line up higher. Um, look, there's different ways on how to like get a line up in a tree. It could be like catapulted. Like we have like these air cannon slingshots that shoot like a little thin line. And then we pull a rope through, um, like try to get it up two thirds uh, and, into the tree and down around the backside and you can tie it to the base and, and pull it over. Right. Cause if you only pull the tree down, like from a knot, imagine like in the top of the tree, like depending on its integrity, it could snap in half. But whenever you base tie it back in the bottom of the tree, up through the canopy and downwards, you're actually putting a lot more of the force downwards towards the trunk whenever you're pulling it over. And there's a lot less chance of, you know, splitting a tree in half whenever you're pulling it over. Um, a few things to look. I mean, I'd love if you're closer. I'd, I'd, I'd come and do this with you. It sounds like a lot of fun. I love. We rarely get to do this in our in our city because everything is surrounded by targets. Hmm. Well, I didn't want to interrupt you, but that is actually exactly how I 
have done it before. So okay, probably great. 10 years ago, I came up with this idea where I saw somebody, they didn't use it for tree purposes, but I built this spud shooter and I have a 10 ounce throwing weight and I have some of that slick line stuff. And I practiced with that. I was talking to Justin last year when we were bowling. We were in Chicago. I think I was telling you about it. So I have an old video on my channel somewhere. The quality is really bad. The editing is bad, but it'll show there's like the crotch of the tree. It looks like I'm kicking a field goal. It's quite yeah. accurate. And I think I, um, there's a, the Schrader valve, I, the tire valve. I filled it up to like 50 or 60 PSI. So I practiced, I have a lot of room in my yard. So I, yeah, shot it through Perfect. there and then tied it to another rope to bring it back up and back through to me. Um, we did make one mistake though. Um, that tree, we started to pull on it, but we didn't continuously pull on it. So it was a, it was an ash tree that was a cluster of like five trees growing out of it. And it had a lot of weird stuff going on. So it didn't keep going the direction that I intended it to cut. It started going the direction I wanted, but then all of a sudden it then turned and went like almost 90 degrees to the side. It all happened in the woods, but just one of those yeah, learn quite a bit about it. I wouldn't cut trees around houses. <laughs> I'd hire one of you guys to come over. The woods can be pretty dangerous though, right, Justin? I mean, uh, cutting stuff in the woods is, is, is like stuff that gets hung up is quite risky as well. So I'm actually more scared of the yeah. woods than, than around houses, but that, that's just me. Huh. The one thing that I have going for me with this cottonwood, it's leaning the direction that I want into an open lawn. So it's leaning so much. And we often have wind that's is leaning to the west, and so the wind is blowing west. So I have a couple of those factors going on, and I'm going to put the rope way up high. I might make a video on it. I'm not sure, but so that's one of my next biggest projects. It's yeah, taking that cottonwood out. So um, I'm just going to see if I. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you this: How do you deal with like poison ivy and like? Allergy season, like the cottonwood trees anyways, for us, that makes my allergies go crazy in the spring. Or like ticks. There's always been a fear of getting bit by those. So, Justin, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, Do you get man, poison ivy? Ticks. He said ticks. That, that like gave me goosebumps. I hate ticks. I don't know if, if you deal much uh, with the bill or, or Mark, but, man, this here anyways in Tennessee last year, we were on one job. It was like a, it was a new build land there. We took out a couple hundred trees, and uh, within the first five minutes, I mean, we picked 14, 20 ticks. I mean, they they were everywhere. I mean, all on our shirts, chest, neck. We were picking uh. them off all day long, and uh, by the time I got home, my wife she uh, she picked uh, off probably twenty or thirty ticks. Uh, and then maybe over the next two days, we were discovering more. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I can't stand it. They're, they're terrible out here, you know, Lyme disease, all that. Um, but uh, I would say poison ivy really isn't a problem for me. Um, I, I haven't really, I haven't got it. I get it every once in a while, like on my hands, barely. I've just been doing it so long. I think I've built up that kind of immunity type deal. Hmm. Uh, but I have had guys, I always keep, you know, poison ivy tech new on my truck, wipes, things for, for the other guys. And I'll let them know, hey, we're working in poison ivy. And uh, this, it it never fails. It's, the guys are always like, oh, I don't get it. I haven't gotten my whole life. I tell them, use it anyways. This is, this is different stuff when you have a vine, you know, this big growing up the tree. And I had uh, two guys back when I was still in the army. They, they came out and helped me work. And I was cutting on a huge oak tree huge vines everywhere and i'm telling you it's raining down sawdust all over and i'm like this is it's bad use the wipe wash off you know and they're like no i don't get it and uh they ended up actually both getting having to go to the hospital get shots their eyes full shut and oh my gosh it's it, it pretty bad it affects different people you know different yeah i'll just respond real quick before phil talks but so i as a home builder most of our projects were like out in the country and uh, yeah, there's some couple comments I got to catch up on when you're done, Phil. Um, so I went to the doctor and I think I had some oral medication and then they gave me 
a steroid type gel. So I still keep that. And when I go to the doctor, like for my annual checkup, I just ask for a refill of that because I, when you start getting those little bumps, I'll put it on and like the next day they're gone. So I just swear by the prescription strength stuff because I get it pretty easy. So, um, all right, Phil, how about you? Do you no, have honestly, yeah, we have, I have nothing to one up Justin. So let's just go to the next subject. <laughs> So do you guys feel, I think I saw that you take off for a couple months during the winter or do you keep busy doing other stuff? And Justin, do you, maybe I'll ask you Phil first, what your yeah, schedule um, so, is like year round and Justin, if you can respond after. Yeah. So we have like in residential tree work, uh, a lot of people like to, like in our area, they, unless there's like a, an emergency, they're not going to really call you to prune their trees in the winter. We'll do some like oak trees that need to get pruned in the winter, for example. We'll do those in, in December when it starts to get cold. But uh, in our line of work of our clientele, especially for like amending soil around trees, we do a good amount of that too. There, there's not much, there's no demand in the winter. No one's thinking about that. We kind of go through this heavy snow season. People disconnect. You'll get one or two phone calls here or there, but we take the opportunity to shut down, uh, you know, rest mentally, rest physically. Um, you know, I I run the company. There's tons of things to do in the background. I'm looking to keep some of the guys on salary uh, in the very near future. Uh, some of the key guys, you know, to work on things and processes in the background. We're currently making like an employee employee uh, manual. James is doing this on some rainy days where he's like building PDFs and whatnot for training new employees on you know safety precautions around the chippers and whatnot. So there's so many things that can be done that you need to you need to find time to do it. And that's what the winter is for us. It's a it's it's a time to disconnect physically and mentally and just focus on other things. I like to travel. I actually I drove through Tennessee. Uh, I was down in Chattanooga for a night. Uh, this winter we're in Florida for for a week. A, a lot of fun. My family and I love to travel, so it gives an opportunity to to do stuff that you you can't do in the summer because the summers are pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about you, Justin? Yeah, I uh, man, it, it, winters have been different for me over the years since I first started doing tree work uh, in Ohio. With the, which, I mean, I'm I'm a big system when it comes to the cold yeah, i hate climbing in the cold and over the years it gets worse and worse and worse so don't make fun of me phil i know I, i've seen some of your videos you climbing in the snow and i'm like oh man we get maybe two snow days out here and uh and those days i will not i, I don't do tree work so uh here i mean it's it's nice pretty much all year round so i try to stay pretty busy all year um but you know we like to travel as well it just makes it kind of you know, get that break that's super important so there's not really an off season but um, you know, it does slow down for me in, in, in certain times, holidays, people doesn't re don't really like to fork that type of money out for, for tree care, tree work. Um, I want to get to the comments. So I have to apologize to everybody watching that I'm not really good at keeping up with the comments. I know other people do that. <clears throat> so that's one of my things I got to work on is being the host to kind of keep that in there. So Jeremy said, I missed a couple of questions. So he's ask about how dangerous is a wood chipper and stump grinder. So I'll just say this and maybe one of you guys can respond. So that, yeah, <clears throat> the wood chipper is definitely <laughs> is like very, very dangerous. I and mean, they both are the stump grinder. What I've seen, like I hired somebody about a year ago and he was standing behind like a shield. So with the controls, so it looks like, are you more protected? Would you say with a st stump grinder? <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. I think other people are at risk. I mean, stuff will shoot out at you. Uh, can oh, yeah. shoot uh, shoot out and, and damage buildings. I could. Uh, the oh, dust boy. is depending on what you're grinding can be bad for your lungs. Basically, you don't really want to find out. You want to take the right precautions, right? We uh, sometimes want to wet down a stump if it's super dusty. Uh, set up extra precautions around, you know, uh, no cars within like 50 feet. Like get your cars out of here. We'll put the plywoods in front. Uh, we'll take all the precautions necessary. Chippers, we're very careful. If someone's walking by, neutral on the chipper right away. Um, no gloves that are baggy, uh, no rings, no watches, no loose clothing. Uh, we're very, very strict on that. Um, unfortunately every year you hear about somebody uh passing away in chipper accidents and it's, it's heart-wrenching for the industry and we can only make everybody a lot more alert i mean as a business owner uh, it's our due to, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that our employees are, are well trained and know every single precautionary 
thing possible. I mean, like a, a piece of wood, I mean, if you're throwing in a big log, you don't stand behind it, don't put your fingers on top, it gets mm -hmm. slammed up. There's a countless things that can go wrong if you don't know what you're doing. So we have to train. And if you, if you don't have any experience around a chipper, uh, I mean, watch a few videos, but uh, be very careful if you rent one. Um, they're very, they can be very deceiving of, of how dangerous it can be. One thing, when I'm doing something very dangerous, <clears throat> I often like to have my noise canceling um, earbuds or the over the ear things with the Bluetooth. And I like to listen to different things, but when it's something really dangerous, then I don't like to listen to anything. I like to have nothing like distracting me so I can just focus on that. So like if I'm running a wood chipper, I wouldn't be listening to like sports radio or something and just not focus. So that's one thing when you do something dangerous that like really forces you to stay in that moment and think about everything. So maybe other people don't have that, but that, if I was running it, I would probably, that, that might be something that I would tell like another employee about that. Um, I want to get to the couple other questions. Oh yeah. So BW is electric. He said long sleeves and tuck the pants in the boot. Yeah. That helps keep it out. Then he said he never had a problem with poison ivy for years and then it hit me clean a riverbank. And when I was reading that comment a little earlier, someone I know lives next to like a really nice stream and it floods every spring. And they said you know, they've sprayed for all the, like the poison ivy, but when it's, when all of a sudden like the river gets really high, it takes all those like poison ivy seeds or whatever and plants them again. So I just imagine that riverbanks can be prolific with Poison ivy, just because what it gets carried in the water. Um, Jeremy, I hope I have your question. So we're yeah we're at the hour mark. I wasn't planning on going any longer than this. I'm not sure if there's any other things that you guys like. I may have missed out on Justin or Phil that you can think of. That any anything you need to loop back to that we skipped over. <laughs> well, I would say listen? if you're. If you no, go ahead. Sorry. Are you self-taught, Justin, or have, have you have you studied? Have you no, have yeah. you gone? That, gone? That's cool. I was actually just going to say something like that uh, to anybody that was interested in in tree care or anything, um, and, and kind of how to get out there. So I actually started doing tree work when I was fifteen, and uh, for a different company, uh, my brother worked for. He was trying to kind of get me out of you know getting into trouble with, as, as a young kid. Um, so that's how I learned. He was one of the, still one of the best tree climbers I've ever seen. Um, so he, he took me on and spent a couple of years. Basically, I was the drone. He went up and told me where to tie in, you know, where to put the rigging line, where to tie, where to cut. And he did this for so long that I just became like just this mindless drone. Um, but I, I will say to anyone that's trying to start out to find a good, you know, reputable company that focuses on all, all the PPE helmet, you know, safety procedures, they're going to train you and spend that time. Um, because that was one of the black. Um, I didn't see any PPE probably for the first couple of years I did tree work. Um, so, you know, tree climbing and, and tree care and, you know, there's, uh, you could probably Google hundreds of tree companies within your state and finding a good reputable one that's going to teach you and give you the right type of training and, and train you the right way is, is crucial. I mean, that's, you know, your, your life on the line. Uh, every single day. Yeah. And so finding people that, you know, care about your well-being, your safety, your comfort, you know, things like that. But uh, no, I, I learned from, you know, I had different mentors throughout the, you know, throughout the years and then kind of devoted myself to education and, you know, arbor culture and, you know, studying for the exam and things like that. Yeah, it's interesting because I have like two new guys this year and they've, I've been watching Tree Care on YouTube and that's amazing and like, and okay, but I don't want you to necessarily learn every single thing that you see. Um, not everything that we see online is right either. And if you're uh, looking again to the business, I, I would recommend joining a company that practices good, safe work practice. That's reality, right? There's nothing like witnessing good, real tree care in real life. I don't want to say this the wrong way, but in, in my province, at least, if you're going to be joining someone who's 50 years old and up, chances are that they have not they've learned it wrong, unfortunately, because it's, it's, I feel like it's the younger generation, like, you know, in the early mid thirties, maybe forties that have adopted better practices throughout the past years. But the older generation, 
nothing against them, but they just learn things differently. And you're going to learn a lot if you're around these people. So I'd say try to find a young and upcoming company that is focused on safety, safe work practices. And uh, uh, yeah, that's that's what's going to help you keep in this industry for, for a very long time is surrounding yourself with the right people. But if you're like me, like I had a, head, had a landscaping company for 10 years and I met James, came into the company. Um, if you're going to bring somebody in to get into tree care, make sure it's somebody that you get along with that will be a, will see eye to eye with, with, with your vision, no pun intended, but <laughs> you have to bring, if you bring someone in and, and change your company, don't, don't go at it on your own. You can't, this is a, this is a, one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. You can watch all the YouTube you want. It's not going to get you ready for real life situations. Uh, it's, it's good to be on the ground and to watch things in real life for a year. At least I would recommend before trying to get up a tree, uh, you're going to learn so much by paying attention on the ground. Yeah. So I'm a little bit of the older generation. So we didn't wear seatbelts when we were driving cars. We um, never wore a helmet riding a bike, drank from the hose. There's just, <laughs> there's a lot of memes that I've seen like about the older folks. So um, do you, so I did have some, so Phil, I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually one of the questions that I wanted to get to. And if we ended it, I probably would have kicked myself. So is it possible to start off as a solo tree person or do you really need to have a, at least a team, a small team to be able to tackle some stuff? I think from a safety I, I standpoint, think- it's better to be at least two. Uh I have someone that's a proficient in first aid as well. Um, there's so many things that can go wrong. It's rare that you can do things alone. You should not be climbing a tree alone without somebody on the ground. You know, that can, in our, in our point, we, we have rescue trained people that, for example, were able to climb a tree and rescue a climber who's injured. That's like, that's a great level of safety. And we can always improve on that. We do trainings, you know, once or twice a year in these kind of dangerous scenarios. But if you're alone, uh, who's going to come and get you? Um, you can also do so much less. You're going to be tired. You're going to be burnt out. So at a mm-hmm. minimum, I would say like join forces of somebody, ideally somebody else who can climb as well. So you can share the workload and bounce ideas off of, because sometimes I'm doing something and I'm not quite sure where it's going to go. And I'll bounce an idea off a more experienced climber and they might have a different viewpoint. And if you just have a, I'll say it, a bozo on the ground, who's like smoking all day and not paying attention, uh, you, you, you're not going to like, you, you can't trust this guy for life. Like if you're rigging, Justin, you do a ton of rigging. If some guy on the ground is, is not there mentally, you can't trust them on your ropes. Uh, your life's at risk. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I, as a, I'm a licensed home builder, so I have to take continuing education every so often. So like one of the very first things that I hear is they talk about safety and like ladder safety. There's been like so many, it's kind of interesting. There's been so many either fatalities or like major injuries from like, I think they said like starting at like five feet. So you don't have to be like way up high on a huge extension ladder. There's a lot of injuries that happen even just like five feet off the ground. Cause they said, you know, your head is then if you're six foot tall, you know, another 11 or 12 feet. So um, that's, that's one of the things they say as a home builder to have, if you're going to hire a crew to go over ladder safety with them, you might think everybody knows how to climb a ladder, but there's a lot of important things. So like, as you're saying, your training, I can really resonate with all those things. Um, so then to become certified, does, is there, so then do you have to take courses or do you just have to take a test to be or a certified arborist? Justin, you were talking about. Yeah, that yeah, was just a, a test. I, I took uh, I, the company I worked for back in Ohio. They uh, they had a little program that you could go through, so they paid for you to take a course, and you just study for however long you know it, it takes you. And so I took I actually took a layoff um, in the winter time so I could really focus on studying and absorbing the material. And then I I took the um, test at a Pearson Review, just a local place. They had it on the computer. I took the test. It took a few hours. And uh, for me, not, you know, having a, a, very, a very, I have a very short attention span. So the the study time, you know, sitting and taking the the test was, uh, it took quite a bit of, of discipline and, you know, uh, time, but it was so much, it, it was worth it. But I mean, 
you know, some of the best tree climbers I've worked with and seen, they're not, you know, certified. So, you know, I think there's a ton of benefit to it, but I mean, you can go in the tree care, you know, tree care industry all your life and, and not get, you know, a certification, but I think there's, it's awesome. And, you know, there's, there's tons of benefit to it. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me when I had to take my builder's exam, there's just, I had this huge book that to go through and I just spent a lot of time. I couldn't really, I just absorbed it, like all my experience, plus the textbook experience it was a major benefit. Do you guys run across any, or I see Scott's got, um, from Acme, has got a question. I'll get to that in a second. Do you come across much anymore where you're surprised like that something happens like every once in a while I'll cut something. I'm like, Oh, I didn't expect it to do that. Like do trees still, surprise you with maybe some the ways that like the grain is twisted or the way a pile of something is like different things going on or have you been around enough things that you kind of know what to expect every single time phil i'll ask you first <laughs> yeah i'd say i'm a little caught off guard sometimes in the spring like uh i haven't done it for a few months and uh, like today i was removing a cedar and i forgot how quickly it peeled and i didn't you, know, you make a notch and sometimes you make we call them mustaches whiskers on the on the opposite sides before doing your back and i didn't do it once on i didn't do it and i thought oh, i should be okay and it peeled a little bit on the side i mean it's a little minor things like that but um it, it, tree work really requires discipline it's about learning where you made those mistakes and where something has gone wrong and how can i improve on my next thing um it takes a tremendous amount of focus that's why i don't understand some people can listen to music when they're in a tree cutting it down and i just personally know i mean i have enough just listening to the guys <laughs> not that that's too much like that's Sometimes I even like tone it down or I'll pull off my ear muscle if, if I'm trying to focus on something and then I'll put it back on. But it's, uh, occasionally things will, will surprise you. Um, it's an industry where we're constantly having to adapt with the situation. Like today we had a stump that was up against a metal fence and we had to make that final cut. And that metal fence was like a chain link was up against the stump. And okay, how are we going to get it off? Well, you're not going to push on it because you're going to be on the same side as, as the cutter. So I went on the opposite side of a rope and a hook. I pulled it away and he was able to make the cut. It was a simple little thing, but it just leads me to, 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 to reinforce that how much we have to adapt with every single situation, every single day. And you have to be at 100% alertness. If you're not 100% alert, you're either going to get injured, somebody else could get hurt, something's going to get broken, a door is going to be left open on the truck when you're leaving. That's why we have protocols and we have rules for every single thing that we do in the company. And we're archiving it on paper. Um, so less and less things surprise you, but whenever they do, you learn. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so Scott from Acme, he's asking, how many chainsaws do you own? So do you guys, like personally, so we'll ask that question. And maybe Justin, if you can go first. And then I'll add to that. This is a question that I had. Do you run mostly like one or two saws on average, like your two favorites, or do you have like a, a mix? So if you don't mind answering yeah, I, those two, two part questions. Yeah. So I'm not exactly sure at this point, like Phil said earlier, you, I don't think you can have enough saws. You just, I get, it's almost like a hobby of mine. I, I like collect chainsaws for a living, um, but I would say between 25, 30, um, I've got a wow. battery powered chainsaws in there. Um, that I use occasionally, but it, it all really depends on the project, on what saws we use. Uh, my dump truck has boxes. They're pretty deep, but I I don't bring like, you know, my two uh, 651s. I, both of them have 36 bars on them. They sit, you know, in the shop on, on a shelf most of the time because I have a 500 i that has a 28-inch bar. I've got a 32-inch bar on my uh, Echo 7310. So it's, it's, it's a range. If I know the project we're going to hit the next day, you know, it's a, it's a 25 inch, you know, trunk. I'm, I might throw my 7310, a couple trim saws, a ground saw, you know, it, it all kind of depends on the project. If we're just doing the trimming, then, you know, we might, you know, only need a, my X620 with a 20 inch bar and then, you know, the climbing saw, things like that. But I don't like to keep all the saws. I mean, I don't have enough room. Uh, but having a backup just in case things have happened with chainsaws for, you know, whatever reason, just wear and tear, or, you know, you blow a chain out, you know, you kick a chain and then for some reason it's kinked real bad. It's a pain in the butt or, you know, you bend the bar or, or whatever. So having backup chainsaws, but I always bring my 500 eye out no matter what, just cause I, I, 
I like the sound. Neighbors will come out. Oh, there's a dirt bike. Or, you know, what is that? <laughs> but, you know, uh, but I have a, a few selected. That would be the 2511T now as my climb saw. And then the, the 500i would be like my two top favorites. Hmm. How about you, Phil? Yeah, same thing. Like our company wide, probably close to 30 saws. Uh, maybe a third of those are battery. And it's kind of funny. Whenever I could, we started getting into tree care, I was like, I was so on a battery train. I said, oh, we have all these battery hedge trimmers. We should only ever have battery saws on the truck. And that I ate those words real quick because as soon as we started doing removals, obviously you started needing gas saws. And we've decked ourselves out. So we have like two of every kind, 592s, 572s, 550s, uh, like I said beforehand. And uh, we try to keep, you know, one or two. We have, we have them split on two trucks, uh, keep doubles of chains on every truck as well. Um, and uh, just so they're ready to go. If you're for bucking wood, if you hit a dull saw, you don't have to change the chain. You just whip out another saw and you can deal with the saw later on at the shop. Um, just efficiency wise, we find it's a better deal. Uh, it's, it's a lot quicker as well. Uh, changing a chain, I mean, some people can do it under 10 seconds. It takes a few minutes. It's, it's, sometimes it's just easier to, to grab another saw. And you like it, it's like if you're doing a removal and you have only one big saw in like the 28 to 32 inch range and something breaks, uh, you might not be able to finish your job with a 20. So it's, and that can cost, if you have to go back and forth from a job mm -hmm. and you've lost efficiency, like the cost of the saw does not look like a lot anymore. So it's the same th thing for a chipper. Uh, we're at a point where we can never go without a chipper. That's why we have two. We don't always use two. Most days only one goes out, but I calculated. And if we miss a few days of work, three, if we miss three or four days of work because we don't have a chipper, um like the, the it's almost the year's payments on 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 on, on the other one right so it's mm. for us it's an absolute no-brainer to have duplicates of almost everything in the shop yeah that makes sense yeah it costs Even a lot to me. just <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say just to show up to the site to coordinate all that i mean that takes money to and then same as a builder just if you forget something so i yeah that, I can relate. I, so Justin, when you were mentioning like the, the dirt bike sound, I have a question. <clears throat> this was on my list. I really wanted to ask this one too. Do you have any issues with neighbors? Like when you're working, do you ever have like a couple neighbors that don't get along so that when you're showing up to the site, they're like, oh, who's this person making all this noise and all this sawdust flying? And I've had a home building project where the two neighbors were they had this long feud over a tree that they cut one time. The branches were laying on his yard. He said, it's not my job to clean it up. It's your job. And they never talked to each other. And we needed to drive some equipment on their land. I'd ask permission and they were nice enough to let me, but I've had some issues with neighbors. So I'm wondering, does that, the saws and sawdust, does that bring out some interesting situations? Yeah, not, not recently, not here in, uh, Tennessee. Thankfully, I haven't had any problems with with neighbors or people or you know sounds. But back in Ohio, I don't know if it's it was just like the area that I was in or what. But over the years, tons of people. I mean, angry neighbors coming out with shotguns. I mean, oh, the police neighbors hating each other. You know, and you know, uh, you know, one neighbor wants to get this tree trimmed that it's their neighbors. They don't own the tree, but they want to. They they want to shove it to their neighbor because hey, they're not taking care of this tree. So I want you to completely just completely hack this one side. Legally, I can cut this over whatever on my property. And then it's just this constant bicker. We've had police escorts on jobs. I mean, and thankfully, I haven't had to deal with any of this kind of stuff as a business owner. But I'm just like, I'm I'm cautious and, and very selective on the kind of who we work with. In, in the areas and things, but you know, the sound is about it. We've had people work, you know, third shift and they're, they're not too happy, but again, it's not, not been here. This has all been in Ohio. It's been very pleasant working in Tennessee. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I, actually, when you said that I had the cops show up one time on a situation where we were trying to bring some equipment in and there's a dispute and we were not in the wrong, but we still had to sort it out with the cops. How about you, Phil? Yeah, I mean, we treat every neighbor as like a potential client. Um, so if we drop a few branches on their side, we're going to make sure to go and get it. We're, we're going to not knock on their door before 8 a.m. 
Um, sometimes, yeah, we do have to start getting things started in the morning. We won't ship before 8 a.m. unless we really have to. Uh, we're, we're, we try to be thoughtful uh, of other people as well. We're not going to park in front of their of their driveways uh, unless it's for a couple of minutes. Not going to unload everything onto their lawns. Um, I mean, I think the the most upset someone ever got at a, someone from my company is probably at me because I squished some ferns in a backyard, which are, you know, perennials and grow back. But um, hmm. we had to diffuse that situation very quickly. <laughs> I mean, James <laughs> had to diffuse it because I was actually in the tree doing the work, dropping some things. And so cut three years ago when I just started climbing and he diffused it well on the ground. I still hmm. own breakfast for that, I think. But <laughs> yeah, long story short, uh, you have to treat the neighbors as, yeah, potential of their clients. And um, uh, you gotta, sometimes, sometimes they don't get along. But uh, I think the a column, like a, a good Bible verse uh, it comes to mind, a good uh, calm answer turns away wrath. And if you're calm and you can diffuse a situation very quickly. Yeah, I can definitely relate with that. I did several years of lawn care and it started out with one person. And the next thing you know, like the next, the neighbor hired me, then the other neighbor hired me. And then before you know it, I had this like whole call the stack. I some were just like one mows, but I almost mow like every single yard at least once. So just being waving to them, being respectful. And so, yeah, that goes a long way. Cause yeah, you never know who's going to want to hire you again. So, hmm. um, yeah, so we're at 920 rep. Jeremy asked if wood chipper's loud. So I think you answered the question. Yes, you don't chip before 8 a.m. Because, yes, those are very loud. So I think, yeah, I think that's all the questions. So... Do you guys now think I left anything out that we would be important to quickly cover? Or do you think we covered some of the things that you guys wanted to talk about too? You guys, Justin, give us a thumbs up. I think, pretty, I think we're, good. we're good. Okay. Good. Well, yeah, that was, this is probably my longest yeah hour and 20 minutes. So I appreciate you guys sticking on. I could talk even longer, but just have to be mindful of your time and our time. And so I know we all probably have to get up and work the next tomorrow morning. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody who has stopped by here and gave us some questions. I think that's a really good discussion. So I want to thank you both Justin and Phil for taking your time out to just thoroughly explain it. I think there's just a lot of, like you said a lot of dangers there and having systems in place, just talking through that before anybody just goes out and starts wanting to start a business, there's really a lot to think about. So um, mm -hmm. if you guys want to learn more, I did uh, mention Echo Means Business. So I have a link down below. You can find out a little bit more. So if you want to get all of Justin's or Phil's links to like their different socials, I have, you can go on that link. But I'll just tell you real quick or ask you guys real quick, Justin, first, is there like one or two places that you would steer people towards a website or Instagram or where's, where are you most active where people can uh, reach I out to or find you? Instagram on my, my Facebook got hacked a hmm. while back, just left it. So website, but Instagram, yes, yeah, Barton Tree Solutions. That's probably, you know, my most, I, I just recently started with YouTube and that's kind of getting off. Okay. And how about you, Phil? Where's a good place to reach yeah, you? Yeah, I'm uh yeah, Instagram, I'm there a lot. Uh at Phil.vision, same here on YouTube at Phil.vision. Uh I've done photography a lot of my life uh, in my teenage years and it's uh coming full circle again. I'm starting to make a lot more videos these days. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And yeah, any questions you guys have regarding the industry, I'm sure uh we're, we're pretty busy. Um, but we'll, we'll, Jess and I would love to help you guys out in any way, shape or form. Oh, well, that sounds great. I wasn't sure if we had like a whole other section to talk about, but maybe if we may, we could potentially do it again. If we have some follow up someday with more questions or you know, just, you never know. So this is really great. I really appreciate once again, taking your time out and answering all my questions and everybody else's questions. So I think we're going to wrap it up here. So Everyone, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.